everybody. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Um, my name is John Hamry. I'm the president of CSS, and I'm also the president of, or the director of the Brzezinski Institute on uh, Geostrategy. And it's, we're delighted to be able to, under the auspices of the Brzezinski Institute, to feature, um, feature Carl Bildt today um, in our Statesman's Laureate program. Uh, I, uh, first of all, before we start, and to say we have a policy here when we have outside groups that meet with us that we begin with a little safety briefing. I am the responsible safety officer, which means if anything happens, you're gonna follow my directions, okay? We've got exits right back here in the exit stairs down in that corner, and uh, nothing's gonna happen, but just follow me if we have to. We're gonna go down the stairs, we're gonna go across the street, we'll meet under that great big beautiful tree, and then I'll see if we can get ice cream brought over or something. So, uh, Thank you all for being here, and we're delighted to have you. I'm especially pleased to welcome Carl Bildt. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with Carl for 15 years, and it's been the most unusual experience in my life to have a foreign minister or former prime minister come, and he spends all his time rummaging through my bookshelves, seeing what he can take, because he wants to read it. You know, it's just un he's most unusual uh, intellect that I've had a chance to experience. Uh, he, has a, he has a driving intellect, an insight. He's got a consciousness of how the, of the dynamic in the world uh, and we, so literally, we said he's got to be at the front of the list on somebody who would share with us his insights about a rather uh, dramatic place in the world these days. He agreed that his, you know, saw his title of his speech, Europe surrounded not by a ring of friends, but by a ring of fire. I think that's emblematic of the forward-leaning character of Carl Bildt as a foreign policy intellect. Uh, I first met him actually when he was a special envoy to, uh, to uh, in the Balkans and was instrumental in helping to bring a peace arrangement in the Balkans. And, uh, while it's unfinished business, it wouldn't have gotten any worse to this stage without Carl's leadership. And so today, I think we've asked him if he would take some time to talk with us about the tumult that we see in Europe, uh, and I think there's no one who would be better positioned to help us think this through than probably, in my view, one of the most strategic intellects that I know in Europe. And so could I ask you, with your applause, to please welcome Carl Bildt. Just talk. Just talk. Thanks, John, and thanks for those uh, marvelous words of introduction. It's been a pleasure over the years to work together with you and um, all of the talent that has always been here at the CSIS on um, all of the more or less pressing issues of the rapidly changing ages. And then, of course, it is a true uh, honor to uh, say something in uh, a lecture in the name of Spig Brzezinski and to be part of the work of the institute that is now set up in his name here at the CSIS. He is truly one of the leading strategic thinkers of the West in our time. Perhaps natural, if we know where he came from, that he's been thinking both in the more classical geopolitical terms, but also seeing the larger battles of ideas that have been so important. I remember way back when I was at uh, university, his standard book, The Soviet Bloc, was something we all read. It's still in my bookshelf. The Soviet Bloc is not in the world, but the book is still a relevant piece of academic work. Without any sort of nostalgia of those days, I think it uh, has become common to note that they, from a purely analytical point of view, were probably somewhat easier. There was, particularly if we see it in the European perspective, there was one evil empire. And policy was a question of containing, and of sometimes containing that, and of sometimes having a confrontation with this particular empire. Then, of course, to the surprise of most of the analytical community, we saw the empire 
collapsing under the weight of its own failures and its own contradictions. And suddenly, we were confronted with the task of building what was referred to at the time as a new world order. The decades that have passed since then have been challenging in many respects. The Balkan Wars can be mentioned. But I would still argue that they have probably been among the very best decades of mankind ever. That certainly goes when you look at global figures for reduction in uh, uh, mortality, for increases in lifespan, for millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty. And it applies perhaps even more, primarily in political terms, to Europe. The European Union undertook the historical enlargement with 10 nations and 100 million people that secured open societies and open economies to half of Europe that had been denied those for several generations. We have finally managed, or did finally manage, to take Europe out of that long nightmare of wars, of destruction, of dictatorships and divisions, which started in the fateful summer of 1914. It was um, little more than 10 years ago, in 2003, that the European Union, in its first ever security strategy, rather boldly stated that, quote, Europe has never been so prosperous, so secure, nor so free. The violence of the first half of the 20th century has given way to a period of peace and stability unprecedented in European history. That was the mood of those days, not that long ago. And it wasn't wrong at the time. It was also in 2003 that the European Union set out to develop what it called its European Neighborhood Policy, ENP for short. Enlargement had transformed the countries that had the possibility to become member, that's fairly obvious. But the influence of the Union naturally stretched well beyond the boundaries that were then established. And in its eastern dimension, the neighborhood policy sought to prevent the emergence of new dividing lines in Europe and to offer the extension of the benefits of economic and political integration also to the neighbors further beyond the immediate boundaries of the European Union. In view of um, the subsequent debates, I think it should be remembered that at the time, this offer was an offer also to Russia. But as Russia had its uh, own partnership and cooperation agreement with the European Union since uh, 1995, and since Russia wanted a far more privileged relationship, it declined to be part of the European neighborhood policy. In its southern dimension, that policy sought to develop instruments to facilitate reforms, developments, and integration throughout the entire vast region of North Africa and the Middle East. I think many of us remember the landmark report by uh, the UN uh, Human Development Report in 2003 that shed new light on how all of these countries were falling behind the rest of the world in virtually every important respect of development. The absence of reform throughout that region could clearly spell the risk of revolution Stability could very easily give way to instability. In the words of the already mentioned security strategy, the aim of the European neighborhood policy when it was initiated in 2003 was, quote, to promote a ring of well-governed countries to the east of the European Union and on the borders of the Mediterranean with whom we can enjoy close and cooperative relationships. Or, in the words of the then President of the European Commission, Romani Prodi, seek to help to create a ring of friends around the European Union. But as we look at the situation now, it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that we are surrounded less by a ring of friends, but rather by a ring of fire. In the East, we have the rise of a revisionist and reactionary Russia, 
challenging not only the very basis of the security of our continent, but increasingly also portraying itself as an opponent to our open, liberal, and secular societies. And in the South, the multitude of economic, political, and sectarian challenges that increasingly question the order across large part of the Arab world, of which the collapse of Libya, the continued destruction of Syria, the rise of Daesh, the expansion of Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups, and also the turmoil in Yemen are just some of the very many manifestations of. The words from 2003 no longer rings true. Europe has gone from a feeling of security unrivaled in its modern history, only little more than a decade ago, to increasingly feeling itself under strain, siege, or even threat, and is accordingly struggling to deal with these new realities, to learn the lessons, understand the challenges, and chart the road ahead. Indeed, to so starting with the formalities, the European neighborhood policy is now up for review this year, and the High Representative has been tasked with presenting a strategic review of our place in this more connected, contested, and more complex world. And let me just make some remarks on the lessons of the past and the challenges ahead. First, fairly obviously, in the East. In the debate in Europe and also here in the States, one sometimes hears the question whether we made any mistakes in our policy in this direction during the last few years. Did we do enough to accommodate the fears or the interests of Russia? In my opinion, it is rather the other way around. The mistake, the mistake that we might have done or made was to let the crisis of the war between Russia and Georgia in 2008 pass much too quickly. Here, Russia clearly demonstrated that its threshold for using military force against neighbors was far lower than most of us had thought. And it also started to elaborate a doctrine of a right to intervene militarily in other countries if it considered that the interests of Russian citizens were not sufficiently protected. But by very soon going back to business as normal in our relations, to which was added the reset coming from Washington and the Obama administration, we might inadvertently have set the signal that we were ready to tolerate a Russian behavior along these lines. It should be remembered that this was a period when we were seeking to deepen in different ways our engagements with Russia. We had initiated the Eastern Partnership with the six countries of Eastern Europe and Southern Caucasus in 2008 and 2009, and in late 2009 and formally in 2010, we started to elaborate what we call a partnership for modernization with Russia. That if you just read what it said, was hardly less ambitious in its approach than the most ambitious parts of the Eastern Partnership. This was, should be added of course, the period of President Medvedev, if he is still remembered. But then of course, things started to change. Prior to coming back for his third time as President of Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin has started to elaborate his concept of what he called the Eurasian Union. And soon it became apparent that this was his great design for the region in the years to come. The negotiations with the European Union on a so-called new agreement de facto came to a halt as Moscow suddenly, without any consultation, announced a customs union that ran completely contrary to the concept of free trade between Lisbon and Vladivostok that until then had been the somewhat distant but still declared aim of what we were trying to do together. In the meantime, Ukraine had in 2011 concluded its negotiations with the European Union on an association agreement and what came to be called deep and comprehensive free trade. Two things should be noted in this respect. The first is that at no time 
did Russia bring up any objections or concern over this during the summits that were held twice a year between EU and Russia? EU has a higher frequency of summits with Russia than with any other country or any other entity in the world at no time did Russia bring up the subject during these years. The subject, the second thing to be noted is of course that this agreement with Ukraine was of course perfectly compatible with the existing free trade agreement between Russia and Ukraine and in no way negatively affected the interests of Russia. You can make the comparison with Mexico being both the part of the NAFTA zone and having a free trade agreement with the European Union. I've not heard anyone ever in the United States claim that the later agreement with the EU hurts the interests of the United States. On the contrary, a more prosperous Mexico is in the economic as well as the security interests of the United States. And exactly the same goes for the effects of a free trade agreement between the European Union and the Ukraine. But they had other thoughts. And from the summer of 2013, the Gremlin initiated a brutal trade, economic, and political offense against Ukraine. Against Ukraine concluding its agreement with the EU. And it was very clear that the ultimate aim was to have Ukraine enter into Kremlin-centric Eurasian Union that was then beginning to take form. The rest, as they say, is history. The Kremlin escalated its economic pressures. It initiated a vigorous political campaign against the course that Ukraine had decided upon. And it then also resorted to first military aggression to take Crimea, and then destabilization and renewed military aggression in eastern Ukraine. A year ago, the aim was clearly to not only incorporate Crimea into Russia, that had already been done at that time, but to establish the so-called Novorossiya statelet along the entire Black Sea coast to, to and including Odessa, with the rest of Ukraine then being reduced to some sort of greater Galicia. Indeed, you can see the clear hints of this in the triumphant March 18 speech of President Putin. But the policy, as a matter of fact, failed. Ukraine, weak as it was, conducted democratic presidential elections, mobilized resistance, and in August of last year, the entire Russian endeavor was close to collapse, and regular Russian battalion battle groups had to be ordered into Ukraine to save the entire separate adventure for complete collapse. Since then, we've had something like a fragile stalemate, codified in the Minsk agreements, in the Minsk agreements in the two separate incarnations. The sanctions much discussed that were decided against Russia after first the occupation of Crimea and then following also the shooting down of the MH17 are in comparison with other sanctions regime in the world, relatively mild. But with the combination of the structural problems that the abandonment of the reform road was starting to expose and the decline in oil prices, there is little doubt that the Russian economy has entered a more difficult period. Diego Gaidar was, in my opinion, one of the most brilliant minds that Russia has produced in modern times. And in his majestic book, Russia, A Long View, that he wrote in 2008, a year before he tragically died, he wrote about the problems ahead, and I quote, it is not hard to be popular and have political support when you have 10 years of growth of real income at 10% a year. When the real income, influenced by vacillations in world markets, stops growing, Unemployment increases, and the situation in the depressed regions grows volatile. The regime has alternative strategies. The first is to increase repression against opposition. That is the tempting but suicidal strategy, end of the quote. Those were his words of warning in 2008. And the structural weaknesses of the Russian economy are indeed very 
real if we look at them. During the next 15 years or so, its labor force will decline by a million people every year. Life expectancy for men is still at levels more associated with Africa than in Europe. And Russia's share of international patents is 0.2%, which I understand is roughly the same as the state of Alabama, with due respect to them. <laughs> but for all of the problems that this undoubtedly entails, I think it would be unwise to expect these in themselves to force the Kremlin to change the policy course that it has embarked upon. And even if there is a weaker Russia, this might not help much if there's an even weaker Ukraine. Power, we should remember, is a relative concept. It is certainly important that sanctions are kept in place as long as the conditions that caused us to decide upon them haven't changed. This is a matter of credibility. Also in view, I would say primarily, in view of what might happen in the years to come, we must not repeat the mistake of 2008. But even and far more important is what we do to strengthen Ukraine. It will be the will and the ability of the nation of Ukraine that at the end of the day will decide the outcome. The actions of President Putin has changed the nation of Ukraine for generations to come. I say with Mr. Valtasari here that it's sometimes said that the nation of Finland really came together after the civil war that its independence in 1917 was associated with, that it really came together in the trenches of the Karelianismus when Stalin attacked it in 1939. And the same might well be said in the future about Ukraine as a result of the aggressions of 2014, invading countries is not a good way of making friends. But Ukraine needs our support and our help to succeed. Its economic reforms require the support of the package of the IMF, as well as the other measures that are undertaken by the European Union, by its member states, by the United States, by Japan, by numerous other countries that are willing to help. The country will go through a valley of tears as these are implemented. But with strong political leadership and support from friendly countries, there is no reason to believe that they will not succeed. And full implementation of the agreement with the EU on deep and comprehensive free trade is also of critical importance. Independent studies suggest that the simple implementation, the simple implementation of the agreement would bring benefits of roughly an additional 6% of GDP over the medium term and roughly 12% in terms of increased welfare for the Ukrainian people. And much more can be expected if Ukraine genuinely implement the reforms foreseen by the agreement, as they would improve the business climate and help to attract foreign investments and technology transfers. But in creating space, but in creating space for the economic reforms and political talks, it is also important to help Ukraine in blocking the military option for Russia. Whether this is done through more direct assistance with training and weapons to their defense forces, or whether the deployment of some sort of international peacekeeping or monitoring force along the so-called touch line is a better option must be discussed very carefully. But to do neither is to risk sending the signal that the military option is a relatively easy one for the Kremlin. And that will, of course, undercut our efforts to seek a political solution. If we look at the situation as it might develop over the next few years, I believe we can see two broad alternatives. The first one is that there is a stabilization and strengthening of Ukraine, facilitated also by the deep economic reforms and that the conflict in its easternmost parts that is initially frozen is over time given some sort of political solution. The holding of local elections according to the standards of the OSCE and hopefully with significant international participation could pave the way for some sort of interim special status 
for the region if that is what is desired. The question of Crimea will certainly remain on the table and can probably only be addressed in a longer time perspective. But this scenario should facilitate more open relations with Russia, between Russia and the West, and should also, in my opinion, highly likely, inspire reforms and changes in Russia itself. The second possibility is that Ukraine falls, fails, and perhaps fractures, and descends into a zone of continuous confrontation and conflict for years to come. And this would be profoundly dangerous. Not only do I fear that it will drive a further militarization of the politics of Russia, but also that the likely war mood of its regime could then drive it into adventures also in other areas, perhaps leading to direct confrontation or even a war with NATO. Thus, it is imperative that we invest as heavily as we can in the first of these options. Its success or failure will decide not only the immediate future and fate of Ukraine, its success or failure will decide the fate of peace in Europe as a whole for years to come. In a couple of weeks, the countries of the European Union will meet with the countries of the Eastern Partnership at a summit meeting in Riga. It is very important that we are then clear that we stand by all of our commitments to them and that we are now prepared to give primarily Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia the help they need in implementing the very ambitious agreements with the EU. The question of membership for them in the European Union is certainly not on the table now. We should be honest in saying that the road ahead is a long one. But we should also be clear that Article 49 of the Treaty of Rome has an open door for every nation of Europe. There are no exceptions that I'm aware of in that treaty text. And the lighthouse guiding reforms and transformation that this does represent, however distant, must not be shut down. As we shot the road ahead, it is of course necessary to have as clear a picture as possible of where Russia might be heading. And that is far from easy. President Putin has made Russia an unpredictable country. That is a danger in itself. That we are dealing with a revisionist Russia is now accepted by almost everyone. It no longer accepts the principles of the post-Cold War order in Europe. But we are also dealing with a reactionary Russia. In the same way as its revisionism seeks inspiration from its history, we see a Russia reverting to a modern version of the reactionary guardian role of Alexander I, as he sought to fight the forces of modernization and popular will in the decades after the Napoleonic Wars. Today's Russia sees itself as a bulwark against Western societies that it describes as too secular, too tolerant, and too open also to other cultures and ideas. We see it trying to paint a picture of a muscular East versus a decadent West. We've got the guns and you've got the gays. We see it trying to play on nationalism across Europe. A revisionist, and a reactionary Russia, the critical question is, of course, whether it's also a reckless Russia we are confronted with. Perhaps, but probably not. I rather see a regime in the Kremlin that seeks to divide, that looks for weakness, and that certainly can be ruthless in exploiting opportunities when it sees them. The days and the weeks after the collapse of the Yanukovych regime in Ukraine was clearly an opportunity, and it was ruthlessly exploited. That there was a certain disarray and confusion in the West was also part of that picture. But if we manage to preserve the unity of the West, the unity of the European Union, and the unity over the Atlantic, and if the elected representatives and leaders of Ukraine manage to preserve the fundamental unity of their country, such opportunities should simply not be there. I'm saying that, but adding two important caveats. First, the risk that Kremlin 
we'll miscalculate. It already did so a number of times during this crisis. It might well happen again, and then it might be far more dangerous. And second, that we must understand that this is an issue that will play out over a prolonged period of time. A new US president will be elected in 2016. There will be key European elections, France and Germany in 2017. President Putin might well have himself re-elected in 2018 for a new period stretching to 2024, when there might well be yet another US president in the White House. On the issue of Ukraine, it will not be enough just with strategic patience. What will be required is strategic determination over a prolonged period of time. This is the key to the security of Ukraine and the stability of Europe, but also to the eventual emergence of a Russia that can be a true partner for modernization and for cooperation and for integration from Lisbon to Vladivostok. Few things are more important. If we turn our attention to our southern neighborhood, the challenges are hardly easier. The thousands and thousands risking and many cases losing their lives crossing the Mediterranean is just one of the signs of the challenges we face. It's crisis after crisis. Libya or Syria or Yemen or Iraq, Gaza heading towards its next explosion, the belt of terrorist organizations that we see from Al-Qaeda in Maghreb over Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab and Al-Qaeda Arabian Peninsula to Daesh and related organizations, all of them in the vicinity of Europe. The issues that we see there are both separate and related. And if you look at the broader picture, I fear that we might well be facing the Arabs' world's equivalent of what happened in Europe nearly half a millennium ago in the Thirty Years' War. It was then in Europe a period of religious turmoil and profound sectarian strife. It was a period of economic hardship, social turmoil, and violent rebellions. It was a period of power politics and proxy wars. It was a period of failing rulers and faltering states. And the very complex complexity of this pattern of interwoven conflicts made it exceedingly difficult for Europe to find a settlement and secure some sort of stability. Just look at the structural issues that we find throughout the Arab region today. In very many cases, regimes that lack true and genuine legitimacy. And in most cases, regimes that can't deliver the social and economic development that is necessary. A feeling of injustice and humiliation that causes very many young people to fall for the lure of fundamentalist calls. A reading of nearly 400 million people that have non-oil exports no larger than those of Belgium. Unemployment rates are the highest of any region in the world. Also in the best of countries, no more than a quarter of the women are employed. Every year, 650,000 persons enter the labor force of Egypt. And with its population growing fast, Egypt, one river through a desert, will within a few decades have more people than Russia spanning 11 time zones. The regions, approximately 400 million people, will by 2050 be nearly 50% more. IMF is saying that in order just to keep unemployment where it is, not reducing it, the region needs to grow more than 7%. That's more than double the rate that it had during previous periods. As things stand today, clearly the chance of that happening is very slim indeed. As we try to shape our policies, we must focus not only on the short-term obvious challenges of the day with diplomacy in region, but also on these long-term structural challenges of the region, and that is natural from the European point of view. We must use all the means we have to advocate more open governments and more open economies, and we must do whatever we can to promote trade, entrepreneurship, and economic development in order to prevent rising despair from leading to even more turmoil and even stronger totalitarian 
temptations. And this must, of course, go hand in hand with an active policy of conflict prevention and conflict resolution. My hope, just to take one example, is that the US would be ready to join other countries in having the UN Security Council lay down the clear parameters for a just and viable and secure two-state solution for Israel and Palestine. My urge would be that the EU uses the opening with Iran that the nuclear agreement will give to promote an active diplomacy in order to seek a responsible Iranian behavior from Herat to Homs. And my conviction is that our concern for the stability of the day must not block our urge to respect the human rights that long term are essential preconditions for the stability that we are seeking. Taken together, there is little doubt that Europe has entered a more challenging period in terms of its security. We hear the thunder of the guns around Donetsk. We hear and see the cries for help in the Mediterranean. And these things are bringing home a new reality also to the ordinary European. Hard power is back in business. Geopolitics is challenging globalization. The cohesion of Europe and the West is under threat. It's only by working together in Europe as well as across the Atlantic and with other partners sharing our interests and values that we can handle the new challenges of this distinctly more dangerous and demanding time. Thanks. Thanks. So you all can see down there. Um, well, I hope you all can see now why I think it's Carl Bildt's one of the most interesting intellects that I've ever met. A you man must, who you must have a fairly uh, restricted number of people no, you see. I, I I've got a <laughs> uh, because it's, he has the capacity to integrate, you know practical, real problems into a theoretical framework. And it's been a very rich presentation, a marvelous presentation. Uh, Carl, and I'm going to pose a few questions, and I'm going to turn to all of you, of course. But uh, let me, you talked really about the two crises, the crisis to the east, the crisis to the south. Let me begin by asking, isn't there a third crisis? And that's the sense of confidence in Europe that it can handle all of these problems. Uh, you know, at, at its core, this complex relationship with Russia, you said both a reactionary and a revisionist power, very interesting formulation. But at its core, President Putin is trying to revalidate an authoritarian mobilization model, you know, where a central government decides and dictates conditions to citizens, uses the coercive instruments of the state to compel their loyalty. Compared against uh, the European ideal of representative governments reflecting the will of society in governments that are accountable through elections and where problems are modulated through a, a political process, it's peaceful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems to me we have those two mm -hmm. worldviews really in competition again. And yet we have Europe deeply divided internally. We have America deeply divided politically internally. Uh, and we've got energy and enthusiasm for this authoritarian mobilization model. I is this a crisis? Well, it's, uh, it's clearly a challenge. I mean, no question, as I indicated and you elaborate. Um, Russia is trying to sort of uh, present a model of sort of uh, muscular nationalism, the strong man. We've seen strong man before, but he's clearly the strong man. If, 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 if you see the pictures that they distribute of President Putin, is together with tigers or motorbike gangs or things like that. It's, it's pictures of the sort that no political leader in Europe or the US would voluntarily have distributed. <laughs> Uh, no, they keep their shirts on. no, but that is the muscular nationalism yeah, yeah, is a yeah, strong man. Yeah. Um, and uh, is this something that is going to fly long term? I don't think it will. 
but there is an audience for it in Russia, there's no question about that. There's an audience for it in certain European countries. They are playing sometimes on the extreme left because the extreme left is against the Americans. There's always an audience for that. And they're playing on the extreme right because they're always in favor of a strong man and militant nationalism. Um, can we handle it? We, of course, discuss quite a lot the divisions that we have. Um, and we do have them. And as you said, Europe has gone through a fairly difficult period. We had five years of dealing just with the Eurozone crisis. It was the one crisis meeting after the other. Europe, as a matter of fact, is always in a crisis because it's always work in progress. There's always things that we haven't done that we are seeking to do. But if we talk about our fundamental strength, it is, of course, significant. I mean, the Russian economy is difficult to know now. The currency is fluctuating, but I mean, it's, it's significantly smaller than Italy, but probably slightly larger than the Netherlands. And I indicated the structural problems. The European economy does have its problems, but it's still the largest integrated economy in the world. It has a significant surplus on its trade with the rest of the world. And is, I think, still the largest sort of FDI and the largest recipients of FDI in the world. Um, so if, that's why I'm saying if we just manage our unity and get together, uh, then I think the, their attempt to overplay their strength will not work. Has the Russian uh, assertion, is President Putin's assertion of sort of spheres of influence and rights of yeah. influence, and the right to move in to defend Russian citizens in other countries, has that caused Europe fundamentally to come together again to revalidate the principles of the European Union, or is the division still strong? Are we, where is it? Well, I mean, start with another organization that you might have heard of called NATO. Um, uh, there's no question that Putin had done wonders to NATO. Um, uh, after a period when NATO was out there in our far away, yeah, difficult yeah, missions, yeah. necessary and honorable and all of that, but, but, but far away, it is now back to the core mission. And, and there, there, there's a new vigor in the organization, no question about it. Uh, people see the necessity of it. It's primarily in the north and the east. Um, so there you clearly see that NATO is back with its core mission. The European Union, yes, is still struggling with economic issues. Uh, Greece is still an issue, needless to say, primarily for the Greeks. And then, if there is a problem, it is sort of, it takes some time. I mean, this is an organization of 28 countries, 500 million people, a rather complex structure of governance. For it to, for a new reality to truly sink in and result in new policy, it doesn't happen overnight. And if there is one thing that is likely worrying at the moment, although I wouldn't overdo it, is that uh, you, you have an element of debate by people saying, well, it's the crisis in the East that we should focus on. And then we have some people in the South saying, no, it's not the East, it's the South. It's what's happening in the Mediterranean. And, and you have a battle of priorities. Uh, and we must come to terms with the fact that we must deal with both of them and learn to handle not only one significant crisis, but several significant crises. I mean, that's... Uh, whether we can learn from the United States, I'm not quite certain, but uh, it might be somewhere else we can learn. You know, I thought, your, I thought your formulation that a lot of the problem began with how we responded to Georgia. And you, yeah. you know, we, it was an assertion, again, of this first time, a very muscular assertion mm -hmm. of a spheres of influence approach to foreign policy. Uh, after Georgia happened, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov went around to many of the capitals in Europe, uh, basic with the same message. I would ask, you know, what did he say? And it was usually the same. You know, we don't like what happened to us when NATO expanded east in our direction. We still don't like that. Mm. We're not going to fight that, mm. but we're not going to let it go any further. Mm. Now let me turn around and ask, what, he, you know, he's recently been articulating this philosophy of defending Russians where they are oppressed. What is the risk of a Russian Anschluss um, in a place like Latvia? It would 
shatter NATO, potentially, depending on how we respond. What, is that a high risk in your mind? Do you think that's a low risk? I think at the moment it's a low risk. Um, I, I think he's, I wouldn't call it bogged down, but it's the Ukraine that is the name of the game. But as I said, uh, if, if we were to fail in Ukraine and he were to succeed, however you define that, then uh, appetite grows with eating. And then I think we might enter slightly more dangerous periods because then you might see the even more revisionist, even more nationalist, even more authoritarian forces in Russian politics uh, coming to the forefront. And uh, there are those whose agenda is, there are those whose immediate agenda, uh, they're quite explicit about it, is sort of the, the borders of the Russian Empire as it once was. Uh, I don't think those are the ones that are steering the policy as we speak, I have to say. But I think we should be aware of the fact that how we handle the crisis now might well significantly influence whether these, they will have any power further down the line. As, as for Russians in, in um, and then roughly, roughly a million Russians in, in Estonia and Latvia, I would argue that those have better human rights protections than every Russian in the Russian Federation. I mean, they can't be thrown to Yale for their political views. And they have significantly better economic and social conditions. And no one has ever come to the idea of de denying them the right to speak their language. It doesn't have in Russia either, but I mean, they are, um, they are part of the European Union. Um, and uh, if there are any human rights issues, I mean, they have sort of the, they can appeal to the European Court of Human Rights, which is the most sort of uh, elaborate and intrusive mechanism for protecting human rights anywhere in the world. Uh, I'm not aware of there being any cases, as a matter of fact, but in theory they could. So they are sort of, I would argue, more protected than the Russians in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, Prime Minister, let me ask, you mentioned that there are two paths forward with Ukraine. One is where we suck it up, start helping them, mm -hmm. get the economy moving actively. Uh, in, in, you know, interject ourselves to this. The other is to let it spin out of control. It becomes chaos, and we've got probably mm -hmm. decades mm -hmm. of a mess. My impression is, is that nobody wants to pay to fix Ukraine. That you know, Europeans don't really want to pay. We don't want to pay. The Russians don't want to pay. I mean, who's willing to really pay to fix a country that has lost so much, con you know, uh, credibility? over these last 20 years as being a responsible state. No, I'm, you're correct. I mean, the amount of money, an amount of money is clearly involved, but the amount of money that is involved in helping the Ukrainians is sort of a fraction of what uh, European countries have invested in Greece. Uh, not that Greece had a stellar track record for managing its affairs prior to that, to put it in those terms. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it was seen as sort of a necessary investment in the stability of the continent in order to try to help the Greek government overcome, yeah, 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 yeah. as long as there was a Greek government that was interested to overcome these problems. That's a separate issue. Um, and and, and uh, everything is, I said, dependent upon there being the will and the ability of the Ukrainians themselves. If they don't do it, we can't do it. But if they are really continuing the course that we see now, it is a fairly limited investment in the stability of the European continent. Uh, taking into consideration the amount of money that has been sunk in mm -hmm. far away <laughs> places of which we have known even less. Yeah. Let me shift and I will turn to all of you. Just I want one last question and I'll come to you if I may. Carl, in your in your speech, and I was fortunate enough to get a copy in advance. You were talking about the crisis to the south, mm -hmm. and you talk about the lack of true and genuine legitimacy in many countries, mm -hmm. and a feeling of injustice and humiliation that mm -hmm. causes many young people mm -hmm. to call for the lure of fundamentalists. Yeah. Um, I think we've been a bit off balance since the Arab Spring mm -hmm. erupted on the stage. Um, it caught us 
at a point where we had mm -hmm. to, we were tension between our interests and our values. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are interested in stability in peacetime. In peacetime, you should be promoting your values, but when crisis comes, you focus on your interests. It seems to me we have a nonstop problem this way. Uh, what, what would be your advice to in this? We've got everything is upside down right now in the, in the Persian Gulf. Everything is it's stabilized in Egypt, but, you know, it's a bit the old pattern. I mean, what, what would you say we should do? Is there a grand architecture for this? I'm not certain there's a grand architecture, but I, I, I argue in focusing on and not forgetting the long-term structural issues, mm -hmm. because if they are not sorted out, nothing else will work. Uh, at the same time, recognizing that this is not done overnight. Yeah. Uh, this is something that will, it's a question of decades in order to fix the region if that sort of somewhat superficial expression can be used. Uh, but as we are involved in short-term conflict management, conflict resolution, conflict prevention, which by necessity we are and should be, um, sometimes I think we have forgotten uh, the long-term structural issues. And it's them that I think drives the short-term problems. I mean, that sentence that we quoted about um, young people, um, when we see sort of the pictures of the awful things that Dash is doing, mm -hmm. we, we tend to say that no one can be attracted by this. Yeah. That is not the case. No. It is a very attractive force in the region among young people uh, because it is seen as uh, justice and revenge. Uh, true values um, uh, in a way that is a rebellion against what they perceive as regimes with limited legitimacy, sometimes imposed by the outside world, sometimes some other things, unable to deliver the economic and social development. And, and then these sort of what I call totalitarian temptations are very strong. And that you can deal short term with a couple of air campaigns, perhaps, but long term, you can't. You need to deal with some more fundamental issues. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, there's a fellow standing up. Let's start back here, and then we'll. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Andrei Sitov. I'm uh, with TASS, the Russian news agency here in Washington, D.C. I'm uh, glad I called on you. I, 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 excuse me? I'm glad I called on you first. Th th thank you, sir. Uh, and I'm afraid my, 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 my microphone is slightly closer. Yes, and I'm afraid my question is not on geopolitics, uh, but it's very important to me, and I think you will see why. Uh, I had a friend in my company. His name was Vladimir Yetsin. He was a photojournalist. Fifteen years ago, he was <coughs> abducted and killed in Chechnya by terrorists. Some other hostages were rescued, so the perpetrators are known. One of the perpetrators fled to Sweden, was detained there on a Russian request, was released there later. Uh, my colleague in Stockholm uh, said that you were in office at that time, and that she actually once brought the issue to your attention and received an encouraging response. But she never could follow up with you on this. So you, I hope you understand why this issue stays with me. I still want justice done. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, yes, and I, my question is very simple. Uh, do you still, uh, do you think that this uh, justice can still be done? Thank you. Thank you. You can choose to answer or not. It's a narrow question. No, it's a narrow question. I, uh, I hope I'm right in knowing the details of the case. Um, uh, and we've, we've, we've had a couple of them, uh, two, I think. I'm looking at the ambassador to be. Um, and uh, Russia has then requested extradition of these persons and say they are probably guilty of something, which I shouldn't. Well, I, I'm not in office, so I can now say highly likely that that is the case. Uh, what is our system is that uh, then that goes to the Supreme Court and that decides if we can extradite. And in this particular case, they said, if I remember it rightly, yes, 
but, they said, and the but was, because we can only extradite if we have sort of reasonable confidence in the legal system of the country, that they will be given sort of some fair process. And in this particular case, the judgment was done that they cannot be given a fair trial in Grosny, because we don't have really confidence in the legal system of the Czech Republic or whatever it's called, rightly or wrongly, I think rightly. But we said if the Russian government can assure us that they can do a trial in Moscow, then we will extradite. The Russian government didn't do that. The Russian government said that that was interference in the legal affairs of the Russian Federation and uh, the trial should be held in Grozny. And that was the standstill. And I think it was, uh, that's our legal situation and, and uh, we were willing to help, but uh, Russia was not willing to take that particular step. Okay, this that's, lady, that's the lady right here at this table, thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Donna Wells. I'm a mathematician. I make predictive math models. Um, right now I have some data that suggests that France specifically has been targeted in terms of violence, international violence in the last year. And I'm wondering if that's something that you've noticed and do you think that's by design? Um, thank you. I mean, we, it, it's very difficult to quantify which countries have been the most hit by violence. Clearly you have the Charlie Hebdo attack and there have been a number of others. Uh, if you take it in a slightly longer perspective, of course, there is still, or there's some time ago, the different legacies of the Algerian war uh, that has its impact upon France. Uh, that has led perhaps to some, somewhat of a more difficult situation in France. But, but otherwise, um, we should be aware of the fact that sort of the things, I mean, wouldn't say that we have terrorism all over the place in Europe all the time, uh, but we've had it in several different countries. And I don't think that we can sort of rest uh, in the conviction that any European country is isolated uh, from this. We, we had one person in uh, 2010 who was uh, trying to blow himself up, in my opinion, in the middle of a subway station, in the middle of Stockholm, uh, on a very sort of night when there were lots of people. He, he was not particularly competent on it, so he blew himself up 200 meters from there, and, and, and uh, that was less good for him, but extremely good for everyone else. And uh, roughly at the same time, uh, our security service apprehended a group of mixed, but also Swedes, who were on their way to attack a newspaper offices in Copenhagen from Sweden, bridge over to Copenhagen, roughly the same as the Charlie Hebdo attack turned out to be. Um, so this is part of the new reality that Europe is living under. Uh, right over here, sir. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joran Lindblad, former member of the Swedish Parliament and the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Uh, Carl Bildt, I'd like to ask you uh, in regards, Russia has never dealt with history, its totalitarian past. The same goes for a lot of the so-called Western countries. The totalitarian past have not been dealt with. Uh, even in Russia, they are closing down the Gulag Museum in Perm, uh, revising history and, and, and what not. What uh, influence does this negligence of history have in today's situation? No, I, th I, I, I think it is very true. Um, they've done it partially, but they've not done it fully. Um, I think it has a negative impact on the domestic development of Russia, obviously, but it has an even more negative development on its possibility of building true bridges of friendship with the neighbors. Um, Germany, to put it mildly, had a rather difficult uh, 20th century. Um, but Germany went through a period of dealing with its history. And that was important in order to get stability to German democracy, but also be made it possible to sort of have a reconciliation with France and even more difficult with Poland and a small country like Luxembourg, which they had maltreated massively. Um, so without that, sorting out the history, recognizing what happened, reconciliation with the neighbors becomes very difficult. And um, that's still the case. I mean, uh, 
in, in the Ukraine case, I mean, you can discuss these things. Uh, historians should decide the details of the issues. What happened during the 1930s, uh, some hollowed or more, some consider that a genocide, some not, but I mean, that has to be sorted out. It is an, it's an open wound. Uh, Katyn, oh, I have to say, I have to say something nice about President Putin. I think of Katyn, as, yes, as a matter of yeah, fact. No, no. Uh, they did move forward. Uh, that was a good thing. I mean, there should be some pluses here. Um, on, on, on the occupation of the Baltic state, it's been back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And now I think it's back again. And they are, uh, Putin had a statement the other day, or the other week, uh, where he said that the uh, August 23rd, 1939 pact with uh, Hitler might have been a rather good idea at the time. I mean, not really the things that inspire confidence in the neighbors. Uh, Daria, right behind you, uh, Jennifer. Thank you very much, Jennifer Mackby. Uh, you very eloquently painted the picture of the threat from the East, but I'm just wondering if you could speak vis-a-vis -vis your own country, Sweden and Finland, not members of NATO, but apparently there's more and more discussion going on about that possibility. Could you comment on that, please? On, on the threat from Finland, or what? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, that's always with us. I mean, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> but I think it's no, no, no. Finland has never been a problem. Denmark, that's yeah, the issue. Denmark, yeah. <laughs> and those no, so you, you mean NATO membership in yeah, Algeria? Yeah. yeah. And um, the threat from the east, <laughs> being Russia. Thank you. No, um, uh, there is a more vigorous discussion about that, both in, uh, both in uh, Finland and Sweden. And opinion poll figures have been moving uh, quite significant. More, I think they've been move, moving more in Sweden than they have in Finland, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, significant steps have been taken, both in terms of increasing cooperation between Sweden and Finland on defense matters within the Nordic countries, and when we say within the Nordic countries, it is by definition with NATO. Since Norway and Denmark are members of NATO, if we cooperate with Denmark and Norway, we do cooperate with NATO, even if it's phrased somewhat differently. And a lot of that is done, and there is a substantial scope for going further, which I think would be exploited in the years ahead. As for formal membership, um, uh, well, let's see. I mean, there's. Sweden decided in the late 1940s not to become a member of NATO. There was a lot of issues uh, debated at the time. But in essence, there was one reason why we didn't enter NATO. And that was called Finland. Uh, that it was out of consideration to the far more sensitive position that Finland had in those days, that Sweden stayed outside. There might have been other, re there were other reasons as well, but this was a dominant one. Uh, things are different, uh, but Sweden would not move on this issue without Finland. And probably the same would apply if we see it from the Finnish perspective. And uh, we will see the uh, government that we have in Sweden today is sort of less enthusiastic about e even about discussing the idea. But there is some opening about studying sort of long-term security cooperation ideas. Um, there's a process underway in Finland as we speak to form a new government. And I would guess that that government will uh, uh, declare that it has uh, an open possibility to apply for membership of NATO, but I don't think it's imminent. But they have a slightly more open door policy than Sweden at the moment, but I don't think it's likely that it's going to happen. In the meantime, we will fully utilize the scope for increased uh, cooperation in different respects. Carl, from, I've got a lot of questions. I want to ask one because I'm surprised nobody's asked it yet. Let me just ask, the big debate going on over here is whether or not we should provide lethal assistance to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, um, as, as I think I hinted in my speech, I think we must do something in order to help to bring, to bring the signal to Putin that there is not a military option for him. And you can sort of strengthen their defense capabilities. That it, and there are different ways of doing that. I mean, training, which is ongoing. Uh, Non-lethal equipment, which is ongoing. Um, and there could also be some lethal equipment. Uh, the other alternative, uh, could be complementary, is, I think, to deploy some sort of peacekeeping force or the international monitoring force 
along what is called the, sort of the touchline. The Russians will not like that. They have explicitly said that they think that is contrary to the Minsk Agreement, which is rubbish, it's not. Um, and the fact that they don't like the idea of a peacekeeping force is, I think, a very strong argument why it might be a rather good idea to have it. Um, uh, because, and uh, I said, you, you could do either of these two, you could do a mixture of them, but to do neither, mm -hmm. I think, is dangerous. The lady in the black dress has been waiting for me, if I could, please. Thank you. Mary Louise Kelly, now with The Atlantic. You mentioned Greece, mm -hmm. and I'd love to press you on that, because that's a challenge of Europe's own making. How confident are you that the euro will survive this ongoing series of crises? And specifically, how confident are you that a year from now, or five years from now, Greece will still be a member of the currency? Well, I'm you asked uh, that the euro will survive. How confident am I in that? Uh, supreme confidence in that, no question about that. Um, uh, I'm also fairly certain that there's sort of a, even this Greek government, which I wouldn't vote for even under torture, um, <laughs> will do its utmost to remain in the euro. Whether they will succeed is another question. Um, the background, I sort of take some issue with how you phrased it. This is a crisis of. Europe's making. I, this is, I mean, the Greek economy has not been messed up by the Danes or the Finns or the Swedes. It's been messed up by the Greeks. I mean, it's successive Greek governments that have fundamentally mismanaged the Greek economy. Uh, within the Eurozone, you have countries that have managed their economies very well. And you have this spectacular example of mismanagement. The fact that you're in a currency union have a certain currency, it doesn't guarantee that everything works smoothly. You can still mess up things, and they did. And uh, then they must get themselves out of it, and, and they have been given massive European help in order to prevent a collapse as a result of their own mistakes. Uh, the problem is that this, this government doesn't want to sort out the problems. They want to continue down a populist course that is fairly similar to the one that brought them into the problems. And what this will entail remains to be seen. Um, I'm on press and trends. I think we're heading for a very problematic next few years for Greece in social and economic terms. Um, what impact that will have on Europe? Not necessarily that big, but it's a country that we all have sort of feelings for and hope that it would do better. But. Uh, I mean, we've seen other examples without too many drawing the comparisons too hard. I mean, uh, Venezuela has messed things up. Argentina has given the one example of the other how you can destroy an economy. So populist policies can destroy economies, and, 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 and Greece is showing that on the continent of Europe in the same way as we've seen it in other parts of the world. This lady down here has been very patient. She's got the scarf on. Could you put right on the table? Thank you. My name is Johanna Mollerstrom. Before I emigrated to the U.S. from Sweden, I was an elected politician for the same party as you. So I think you will not be surprised that I, I agree to a lot of your views. But one thing I would love you to elaborate a little bit on is um, in what respect do you think that the internal crisis that at least I see in terms of the rising populism with various shades of racism in, in Europe and Sweden also, to what extent do you think that is a consequence of the crisis, the multiple crisis that you are talking about, and to what extent do you think that this populism has consequences for how Europe can act um, in resolving or handling the current situation? It depends. Um, it's, it's very different in different countries. Um, uh, we have, as you say, we have the, the rise of sentiments that are very different in different countries. I mean, to say that there's a uniform wave is, I think, to exaggerate it. If you look at the Front National in France, it's a very French phenomena. You have nothing of the sort in Germany. You have a small party that is the Allianz für, or Alternative für Deutschland, but has really nothing to do with Front National. Uh, and even if you t take these populist parties in the uh, Scandinavian countries, they're sort of, they're different to their origin. 
what might be what might be the thing that unites them? Um, to some extent, immigration. Um, but in more general terms, I mean, they, they, there's a section of the electorate in all of our countries that thinks, that believes that things have gone too fast. Society is changing too fast. Globalization has brought in not only immigrants, but uh, rapid economic change and rapid social change. And uh, they are the ones that sort of uh, could conceivably listen to sort of the temptations of the sort of muscular nationalism, uh, orthodox muscular nationalism that Putin represents. Uh, racism, yes, but primarily not that. I, I, I would say sort of that feeling that stop the word, I want to get off. Things were better before. Uh, that, that's the sentiment that is there. And that is the task then of the so-called established political parties to handle that. Every democratic system, every democratic political system, now and then is subject to the rise of a new force of different sorts. That's the way democracy works. And then democracy is supposed to take care of that in the way that you sort of try to convince those particular ones or tries to get them back into some sort of reasonable fold. We'll see, Finland is gonna be interesting again to see they have this party which is, I think we call them, do we call them Finns or true Finns in English? We call them true Finns, I think, so. True Finns. They are Finns, but not very true. Well, anyhow, they call them true Finns. Um, um, whether they decide to take them into government or not. Um, uh, which I think is highly likely. And if they do that, then it's a question of trying to then to integrate them into the political system in order to handle that particular, particular sentiment that is there in part of society. I'm sorry, we've got so many questions. We only have time left right here in this table, Dari, and then this will be the last question. Hello, Tom O'Donnell. Um, I, actually, I've lived in Berlin the last few years. I'm here with the American Institute of Contemporary German Studies to, uh, for a while. So I'll ask you a question about Germany. <laughs> I, as, as an American going to Europe, I was a little bit surprised. Uh, uh, you know, this is the era of the wall came down, everybody celebrates, this is sort of the official ideology of this is. But w when you look at the nitty gritty, I'd, I'd like to ask your opinion of uh, a couple things. On the one hand, uh, there's this aspect of Germany taking a leading role uh, recently. And the question then is, are they prepared to take this role? And I see when I hear their diplomats and officials talk about the difficulties of the making decisions. Mr. Steinmeier, I think every speech he gives, he starts on Ukraine by saying, of course, anything besides a diplomatic solution is unthinkable, which I, even if you think that, I wouldn't want to tell Mr. Putin every day. So there's the elite, but I must say also, I'm surprised. I need to focus on your question. Yes, this Let's is my question. question. If you could comment on that, uh, I, won't, I won't speak of it. Amongst the people, there's also quite a bit of disillusionment with the Western, uh, after all, after Iraq and so forth, what's Putin doing different? But if you could just speak to this issue, uh, the leadership of Germany. Speak to German leadership um, on this. Yeah, um, Germany has got itself in the leadership position very much on primarily the Ukraine issue, and there are a number of reasons for that. One of them is that when I, I said that the Putin and the Russian policy is, of course, trying to divide Europe, trying to get understanding, no country is more important for him from that point of view than Germany. I mean, not only does he have his own political history, personal history in Germany, and speaks the language and all of that, uh, but there's also a history of sort of German-Russian understanding and trying to get things moving together. So, and, 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 and of course, then we have the Schroeder and the, this, uh, you know, this phrase in the German debate, the Russlands Versteher, um, the uh, a segment of German opinion that was said to be rather understanding of Russia. Some of them for reasons that I can understand, uh, in the sense that there was a deep German feeling of gratitude to Russia for reunification. The peaceful reunification of that country would simply not have been possible without Russia agreeing to it. And a lot of them still feel that they have, they owe a gratitude to Russia. Um, so he's been playing on, uh, on, on, on Germany. But he's encountered Chancellor Merkel, who is uh, quite a tough lady. 
And uh, if, 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 if Putin has his history with Germany, she has her history with policies originating from Russia. Uh, he speaks German, she speaks Russian. And uh, that has led to sort of uh, them being uh, very much in focus, and I think she has handled it extremely well. Uh, she has been sort of the guardian of the European interests in, in the dialogue, in the, in the harshest of the dialogues with Putin. So there was a reason that they were really playing on Germany to a large extent, and there was a reason why sort of Germany stood up to it. And, uh, has also been very keen. Germany has just made a, uh, made a review of its foreign policy and sort of big debates and published documents and things. And Germany is extremely keen to say that what we do, we do within a European context as, as representative of the rest of the Europeans. So it is German leadership, but within a very clear European context. And so far, I think, even if I would in principle say this should have been done by the EU institutions in Brussels, but so far I can't complain about the practical results of it. On the contrary. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you've seen why Carl Bildt is uh, seen as being one of the leading foreign policy intellects and leaders in Europe. I think we're very grateful. You spoke to us, you reasoned with us, you helped us understand. Uh, would you all, with your applause, please say thank you. This is really fun. Thank you.